Kodero show for this week. If you're just joining us this time, please don't forget to subscribe and uh, also follow us on Instagram and at Facebook. Now, here is how Africa looked before colonialism, pre-colonial Africa. Here is how Africa looks during the colonial period. And this is how Africa looks after independence. This week, we're talking about scramble and partitioning of Africa. Why did Europe colonize Africa? What were the debates and the ideas that motivated the conquest and the colonization of Africa? And we also offer a brief history of Europe and Africa. And what is the significance for all of this? What? Just so you know, think about China. Think about all the powers that are starting to be interested in Africa. And then you, all this will make sense for you. Now, there are two contesting theories about partitioning and scramble for Africa. And one is a book written by, uh, by somebody called H.L. Westling. The title of the book is Divide and Rule, the Partition of Africa. And he offers an argument. And his argument is this, that Europe wasn't really interested in Africa, that it was happenstance that things were happening, particularly with the, uh, the Ottoman empires dominating most of North Africa and continental European powers thinking that it was important to stop the Ottomans, particularly in the Nile Valley. And by the British coming into the Nile Valley, started up a, demo, a domino effect that spread around in the Nile Valley down into East Africa and subsequently South Africa. He also says that Africans are partially to blame for colonialism because they were receptive to it and they did not fight enough. Controversial, right? Think about Kanye West and what he talked about slavery. Seems pretty similar. Then there is another argument uh, writ written by Thomas Packingham in a book called The Scramble for Africa. And in this book, he says that British colonialism and other European colonial powers were mostly motivated by the three C's. One, Christianization, civilization, and commercialization of the continent. This argument is usually done uh, on the, from the perspective of colonial powers and has very little uh, narratives of the Africans themselves. Now, think about these debates as we move on. And I'm going to go to the next section here, which is the pre-scramble. Uh, and as the African contact with the Europeans. And what I start with uh, is a historical listing of when Europeans first contacted Africans. And we, we trace back to European history. Here we talk about the Romans who led expedition into Sub-Saharan Africa. Think about the movie Gladiator and the character Juba, who is played by Jimon Honsu, the Benin actor uh, in, in this movie. And he's captured as a slave, sent to Rome and Italy, and he's a great fighter. That is embedded on a background of Roman contact with Africa. And from that, we can see that evidence, or oh, the Romans knew about Africa, but it wasn't only restricted to their slavery and stuff. The Romans actually had provinces in North Africa, what we call the Carthage region or the Maghreb, uh, which in Swahili words today is called the Maghribi, which means West. So the Romans were there and later on, in the 1400s, the, a Portuguese explorer called Diego Chao, or Diego Cao, I don't speak Spanish, uh, Portuguese, so excuse me. Diego C.A.O., 1480s, uh, forms an, uh, an expedition which leads him to the Congo River, uh, presently Namibia area, Angola, and the Congo. And here he, he meets the king of the, the Bakongo people, and forms a trade relations which led to sending of diplomats from the Congo to Portugal and teaching the, uh, Portuguese, the Congolese people how to speak Portuguese, uh, establishes churches, and also learns how to read and write. So this was pretty cool until it turned into slavery later on. And then in the four, late 1480s, Vasco da Gama make the first expedition that goes across the Atlantic into the Indian Ocean and establishes the first 
Portuguese colonies at the seaports of Africa, starting from Luanda all the way to Mombasa, to Mogadishu, so on and so forth. Later on in the 1650s, Dutch Indies companies uh, explored southern, southern Africa, leading to the Dutch settlers, famously called the Boers, who settled in East Africa, in South Africa, and form the first European settlement in the continent of Africa. In the 1830s, uh, French people are, uh, get interested in Algeria. Later on, there was also... Okay, in addition to that, there was also the American interest uh, the, as uh, abolitionists in America started to talk about freeing slaves in America and relocating some of them to Liberia. This is happening around 1820s to 1847, uh, where Americans start to find a colony uh, in Liberia, which I talked about a little bit last week. Now, as these things are opening, happening, there is also the increase of European fascination with the continent of Africa. Uh, and this is mainly done through European uh, explorers and uh, who paved the way for missionaries. And one of them is David Livingstone, who is a British uh, explorer and a Christian missionary who travels into the hinterland of Africa to look for the source of, of the Nile and to spread Christianity. Uh, he is instrumental in the colonization of the Zambia, Zimbabwe area, and also to the Christianization and subsequently formation, re, a translation of Bible into native la languages. This also Henry Stanley, uh, an American scholar who, uh, who is commissioned by uh, the Belgians to explore the Congo and later sell the idea of colonizing the whole of Congo to King Leopold, who treats the, Con King, uh, the whole of the Congo, the side of Western Europe, as his own private property. There's also John Speaks, uh, who discovered the source of Nile, where we were told in, high, in primary school, was the first man to see the source of the Nile. We, we know that was true because people had been living in the Nile for a long time. But anyway, he is the I, a guy who is instrumental in the distinction of the Tutsis and the Hutus in, uh, in, the, in, in the Rwandan, in, in the Banyarwanda countries of uh, Burundi and Rwanda. Subsequently, lead those ideas, racialized ideas, lead to the genocide of 94. So, this is European explorers, and they are instrumental. Just stay with me. Follow my logic. So, wh why will these Europeans be interested in Africa? What was the incentive for colonialism? Uh, one of them was that at this period in the 1800s and early 1900s, Europe has industrialized or is industrializing and these colonial powers are interested in insulating the empires from the economic circles of boom and boost. And Africa uh, is seen as an opportunity for cheap raw materials like diamonds, rubber, uh, gold, and many other things. And also for exclusive markets driven by economic policies called mercantilist economics, that is, a, a, a economics of the state, the state as being seen as the engine to acquire and protect good and to grow economy. These economic interests are also embedded in what we call geopolitical interests, the control of strategic positions. So the British are interested in controlling the Swiss Canal. Uh, some French people are con interested in controlling Western Africa and also the Horn of Africa is important to the Italians for some reasons. Nobody quite knows why. But the most important here are two things. One is nationalism. And you have to think about uh, the colonial colon colonialism and the scramble for Africa as an attempt to project national power. So small countries like Belgium are interested in occupying territories that are almost 100 times their size for the simple fact that it makes King Leopold looked like a great king. The British are interested in expanding their reach of the world so that they're seen as an all-powerful kingdom. And the Germans are also interested, including committing acts of genocide in Namibia. All this is done to project power, influence, and uh, subsequent um, 
grandness of their countries. But one of the most important things here, which I want you to take note, is that the, this idea of the conquest and colonization of Africa is embedded on the ideas of liberalism. The liberal tradition em emphasized the perfectibility and growth of mankind, so that man was a function of progress, a function of industry, something that could be shaped and refined at time's goes. And these ideas come from the works of Charles Darwin and his ideas of evolution. And so these ideas of evolution transcend from physical evol evol evolution of man from monkeys to homo sapiens to social Darwinism. The idea that the, the European was the most evolved human being on the planet of the on the world and was not only evolved um, physically but also mentally and culturally and because he had evolved as the european man he had the power to conquer and civilize the rest of humanity which were called the lower races how does this lead to the scramble now in 1894 1895 a German leader, his name is Otto von Bismarck, calls a conference to discuss, among other things, uh, avoiding costly wars in this continent that Europeans had discovered. And the mission here is to, one of them was to stop wars with the Ottomans, to discuss the Ottomans. But subsequently in the meeting, what arises was in order to stop the Ottomans, Europeans had to subdivide the continent of Africa so that they could avoid unnecessary wars in Africa to maintain peace in the continent of Europe. And also, one of them was to promote free trade in Africa and to civilize, Christianize, and commercialize this continent. And what this led to was the subdivision of the African continent into this, as I said earlier. And another was the granting of the whole of the Congo Free State to a gentleman called King Leopold, who went on to do a lot of atrocious things leading to the murder of 20 million people, all in pursuit of profit. Can you think about that? This guy killed more people than Hitler did. Now, African didn't take this lying down, obviously, as many people will assume. There was a lot of wars fought in Africa to resist colonialism. One of them was the British Boer War, 1899 to 1902, which leads to what we call the second track. The march of the uh, Boers from what we call Transvaal and Orange Free Street all the way north, leading to consequent actions like movement of African people from their areas running away from the Boers. The Mighty Maji Rebellion, 1895, where Tanzanians fought hard, a community of many people, ethnic groups, joined hands to fight German colonialism and to resist forced labor. The Zulu-British War, which was uh, in Zululand, which was pretty much the Zulu's resistance of British takeover of their region. Also, there was the Ashanti resistance, which mostly important in this regard was the, le the role of women in, in the Ashanti Wars and their resolve to fight British rule and takeover of their continent. Now, lastly, but most importantly, this scramble for Africa was more made possible for one thing, the Maxim gun. The Africans lost this war, uh, uh, they lost the entire continent, not only because they were inadequate in some ways. No, they had some guns, but the invention of the Maxim gun, which I show the picture here, made it possible that a few Europeans could take down an army of like thousands of people, as we had seen, as, as has been demonstrated in Sudan and in the Zulu war. So the Maxim gun is to be blamed in most ways. But here's what I want to say, say, that the scramble leads to what is then called shallow colonialism. And to expand a little bit on this, Wait till next week where I do a second uh, series on, of this part on colonialism. Thank you for joining me and let me know if you have any things that you need me to talk about. And feel, uh, don't forget to subscribe at the Uba Cordero Show. See you next week for our continuation series.